Good afternoon, everyone. Authors at Google New York is pleased today to welcome John Ronson. Hello. Hi. So uh, the psychopath test, it began, I was at a friend's house, and she had on her shelf a copy of the, uh, the DSM manual, which I'm sure you all know about. It's the Manual of Mental Disorders. Uh, it started off um, in the 50s as a very slim volume. There are very few mental disorders in the 50s. And then it grew, and it grew, and it grew. And it's currently 886 pages long. And it lists every known mental disorder. And there's currently uh, 374 mental disorders. Uh, so I was leafing through the book wondering if I had any mental disorders. And it turns out that I've got 12. Um, <laughs> I've got generalized anxiety disorder, which frankly, I didn't need a book to tell me. I've got a uh, nightmare disorder which is categorized if you have recurrent dreams of being pursued or declared a failure. And all my dreams involve people pursuing me and declaring me a failure. Uh, I've got parent-child relational problems, uh, which I blame my parents for. Uh, I've got malingering. Um, and I think it's actually probably quite rare to have malingering and generalized anxiety disorder. But there you go, I've got both. Um, the new. Uh, edition, as I'm sure you all know, is about to come out in May, and they've just announced some of the new disorders uh, that are going to be in there, intermittent explosive disorder. There's a version of it in the current DSM-4. But now I met the head of the DSM, the new DSM, a couple of weeks ago, and I said to him, uh, OK, if you break a bottle against a wall twice in a year in anger, does that mean you've got intermittent explosive disorder? And he said, yes. So there you go. Uh, also, uh, they've been thinking about putting internet addiction uh, into the new DSM. Uh, but now they've decided to put it into the appendix, which is the graveyard of mental disorders, which actually I'm kind of pissed off about, because um, at the times when I've accidentally typed my name into Google uh, and inadvertently pressed search, and I found people slagging me off, I kind of like the idea of them being declared insane. But uh, unfortunately, internet addiction isn't going to be a full-blown disorder. Um, much later, by the way, I was wondering, you know, why, you know, all these mental disorders? Was I much crazier than I thought I was? Or maybe it's not a good idea to diagnose yourself with a mental disorder if you're not a trained professional. Uh, or maybe the psychiatry profession has a kind of strange fetish to label uh, increasingly normal behavior as mental disorders. I, I didn't know which of those things was, was true. Um, but I thought it was really interesting to try and solve that mystery. Um, much later, by the way, I met the man who turned the DSM from a, from a pamphlet into a brick of a book. Uh, it was a man called Robert Spitzer, um, who, who's now in Princeton. Um, at the time, he was at Columbia. And Robert Spitzer's story is that he hated Freudian psychoanalysis uh, because his mother was miserable her whole life, and, and she died unhappy, and she'd gone to Freudian analyst after Freudian analyst, and none of them helped her. So he grew up with this kind of you know, hatred of, of Freud. And when he took over the um, editorship of the DSM, he decided that it was his destiny to eradicate Freud from psychiatry and replace all that sleuthing around the unconscious with uh, checklists. Um, so he called all his like-minded people into conference rooms at Columbia. And he'd say, who's got ideas for the mental disorders? And people go, oh, well, ADHD. And he'd go, what's the checklist? And he'd go, ah. And he'd type it into his typewriter. And that's how ADHD came to be a mental disorder. And it's how bulimia came to be in the DSM, and so on. The person who shouted the loudest, um, he would listen to them, and he'd type it into his old typewriter. And there it was, sealed in stone. And I said to him when I met him in Princeton, a couple of years ago, I said, were there any proposed mental disorders that you rejected? And he said, yeah, there was one. Um, atypical child syndrome. Uh, he said the problem uh, with it was when I asked the man uh, proposing it what the shared characteristics were, he said, that's very hard to say because the children are very atypical. <laughs> he said he was also going to. Um, put in a masochistic personality disorder, which would be for women who remained in abusive relationships. But he said he got into terrible um, trouble with the feminists. Uh, and so he changed the name to self-defeating personality disorder and shoved it in the appendix. 
Uh, so this was much later. Um, and uh, when I was at my friend's house, I was wondering, well, you know, what is this with mental disorders? What's, what's the issue? And so I decided to meet a critic of psychiatry to get their view, uh, which is how I ended up having lunch uh, with the Scientologists. And it was a crack team of Scientologists. This was in London. They're called the CCHR. And it's their, it's their destiny to destroy psychiatry wherever it lies, um, probably because of difficult relationships between our own Hubbard and psychiatrists back in the day. And I had lunch with, with, with the head of the London branch. His name was Brian. And I said, can you prove to me that psychiatry is a wicked pseudoscience that can't be trusted? Can you prove your, your ideology to me? And he said, yes, I can prove it to you. And I said, how? And he said, I can introduce you to Tony. And I said, who's Tony? And he said, Tony's in Broadmoor. And Broadmoor is, is Broadmoor Hospital. It was, it was Britain's most notorious, mythologically notorious asylum for the criminally insane. Um, it's now called, of course, Broadmoor Hospital. And I said, what did Tony do? And Brian said, hardly anything. He beat someone up or something. But the point is, he decided to fake madness to get out of a prison sentence. And he faked it too well. And now he's stuck in Broadmoor. And the more he tries to convince the psychiatrist there that he's sane, the more they take it as evidence that he's crazy. Do you want us to get you into Broadmoor to meet Tony? So I said, yes, please. So I'm going to read a tiny bit from the psychopath test as uh, what happened when I went to Broadmoor. Uh, I got the train there. I uh, began to yawn uncontrollably around Kempton Park, which is what dogs also do when anxious. Uh, and I got to Broadmoor and I met Brian and we were taken through high security gate after gate after gate into the wellness centre, which is where you get to meet the patients. And it's all calm in colours, like peaches and pine. And, and uh, I'm going to do a little microphone experiment of, of, of like leaning back a bit and seeing if you can still hear me. Is that OK? Because I was getting a crane. Um, OK. Um, so the wellness centre at Broadmoor, it's all peach and pine and calm in colours. It looks like a kind of travelling. Uh, and the only bold colours are the reds of the panic buttons. And um, Brian said to me, you know, Tony's the only person in the entire DSPD unit to have the privilege of meeting people in the wellness centre. And I said, what does DSPD stand for? And Brian said, dangerous and severe personality disorder. Uh, so I said, is, is Tony in the part of Broadmoor that houses the most dangerous people? And Brian said, yeah, isn't that insane? Um, and then the patients started drifting in, and they were all... Um, quite overweight and wearing sweatpants and shuffling and, and uh, they had sort of doleful eyes and Brian whispered to me, they're medicated, which to a Scientologist is like the worst evil in the world, but I'm thinking it's presumably a good idea. And then Brian said, here's Tony. And a man was walking towards me and he wasn't overweight, he was in excellent physical condition. And he wasn't wearing sweatpants. He was wearing a pinstripe suit. It was evidently the outfit of a man who wanted to prove to me that he was incredibly sane. So he sat down. And I said, is it true that you faked your way in here? And he said, yeah, absolutely. I beat a man up uh, in uh, Reading, which is uh, just west of London. Um, and I was, and my, I was on remand. And my cellmate said, you're looking at five to seven years for this. What you have to do is fake madness. Tell him you're mad, you'll get sent to some cushy hospital, you have your own PlayStation, nurses will bring you pizzas. Um, so he said, so that's what I did. And I said, how did you do it? He said, well, I asked to see the prison psychiatrist, and I just seen a film called Crash, in which people get sexual pleasure from crashing cars into walls. Uh, so I said to the psychiatrist, I get sexual pleasure from crashing cars into walls. And I said, what else? And he said, oh, I told the psychiatrist that I wanted to watch women as they died because it would make me feel more normal. And I said, where'd you get that from? And he said, oh, from a biography of uh, Ted Bundy that they had in the prison library. I said, anyway, I faked madness too well. They didn't send me to some cushy hospital. They sent me to Broadmoor. And the minute I got here, took a look around, asked to see the psychiatrist. I said, there's been a terrible misunderstanding. I said, how long have you been here for? 
He said, well, if I had done my time for the original GBH, I'd have got five to seven years. I've been in Broadmoor for 12 years. <clears throat> it is an awful lot harder, Tony told me, to convince people you're sane than it is to convince them you're crazy. I thought the best way to seem normal, he said, would be to talk to people normally about normal things like football. That's the obvious thing to do, right? I subscribed to New Scientist. I like reading about scientific breakthroughs. One time they had an article about how the US Army was training bumblebees to sniff out explosives. So I said to a nurse, did you know that the US Army is training bumblebees to sniff out explosives? <laughs> Later, when I read my medical notes, I saw they'd written, thinks bees can sniff out explosives. I remember when, when, when um, Tony said this to me, I thought it was probably a good idea that I hadn't met any psychiatrists when I was um, writing The Many Stare at Goats, um, which is, people, people don't know it's full of that stuff. It was uh, my previous story. It was about, um, I was in Hawaii, and I met a man called Glenn Wheaton, who was part of a secret US military unit called Project Jedi. And I said, what was Project Jedi? And he said, it was a series of levels. And I said, what was level one? He said, level one was observation. You walk into a room, how many chairs are in the room? The super soldier would just know. And I said, what was level two? He said, level two was intuition. You have a fork in the road. Do you go left? Do you go right? You go right. And I said, what was level three? And he said, level three was invisibility. Um, I said, that's quite a, a leap from uh, level two. I said, well, actual invisibility. And he said, at first, but after a while, we adapted it to just trying to find a way of not being seen. So I said, like, camouflage? And he went, no. <laughs> <laughs> he said, level four was we had a master sergeant that could stop the heart of a goat just by wanting it to stop. And I said, did he ever manage it? And he said, one time. But his heart got damaged at the same time. And I said, what was the goat psychically fighting back? And he said, no, the goat didn't stand a chance. <laughs> he said, it's what's known in uh, paranormal circles. It's sympathetic injury. <clears throat> he said, one time they had 30 goats in a room, and they were all staring at goat number 16, and goat number 17 fell over, which I guess is collateral damage. <laughs> When you decided to wear pinstripe to meet me, I said, did you realize the look could go either way? Yes, said Tony, but I thought I'd take my chances. Plus, most of the patients here are disgusting slobs who don't wash or change their clothes for weeks on end, and I like to dress well. Tony said he, he didn't like hanging around with the other patients. He said he had, on one side of him, he had the Stockwell Strangler, and on the other side of him, he had the Tiptoe Through the Tulips Rapist, and he said he found them unsavory and frightening, so he stayed in his room a lot. And he said they, they took that as a side of madness, because they, they, they said it demonstrated that he was aloof and grandiose, so only in Broadmoor would not want to hang out with serial killers be considered a sign of madness. Um, anyway, um, Tony seemed completely fine to me, just normal and sane, but obviously what did I know? So when I got home, I wrote to his clinician, Anthony Maiden, and I said, what's the story? And he wrote back to me and he said, it's true, we accept that Tony faked madness to escape a prison sentence because his delusions that had seemed very um, cliched to begin with just vanished the minute he got to Broadmoor. However, we have assessed him and we've determined that what he is, is a psychopath. And in fact, faking madness is exactly the kind of cunning and manipulative act of a psychopath. He says on the checklist, item eight, cunning manipulative. And I said to other clinicians, what else? And one of them said to me, the pinstripe suit, classic psychopath, speaks to items one and two on the checklist, grandiose sense of self-worth and glibness superficial charm. Um, not wanting to hang out with the other patients was classic psychopath. It spoke to um, lack of empathy and also grandiosity. So all the things that seemed most um, ordinary about Tony was evidence, according to his clinicians, that he was crazy in this, in this new way. He was a psychopath. And Tony Maiden said to me, if you want to know more about psychopaths, you can actually go on a psychopath spotting course uh, with uh, Robert Hare, who's the creator of the checklist, the PCLR psychopath checklist, like the grandfather of psychopathy studies. Uh, so I did. I went on a, on a Hare course, uh, and I am now a certified, 
I have a certificate of attendance, and I have to say extremely adept psychopath spotter. Uh, so these are the statistics. One in 100 <coughs> regular people is a psychopath. Um, so uh, one in 100 walking around regular people are psychopaths. It's according to Robert Hare and his, and his group. Um, but that rises to 4% of CEOs and business leaders. You're four times more likely to have a psychopath at the top of the tree than you are to have one as your underling. Uh, because, of course, capitalism at its most remorseless rewards psychopathic behaviour. Uh, it rewards the lack of empathy and the grandiosity and the, and the uh, impulsivity and the irresponsibility. Um, these things are rewarded um, by an out-of-control system. Um, this was what Hare was, was saying to me. Um, I have to say, when I was learning all of this, I, I, I'm wondering what I should do with my newfound psychopath spotting skills. I thought I, I, I wouldn't put them to philanthropic good use. What I would do is think about all the people in my past who had crossed me to see which of them I could out as psychopaths. Um, so the first on the list, I don't know if there's any um, British people here, but uh, or indeed Vanity Fair readers, because the first on, on my list was A.A. Gill, the critic A.A. Gill, um, who um, is a classic psychopath. He, he gave me um, very, very bad reviews for my television documentaries over many years, which is classic psychopath. Plus, um, he once wrote a column about how he wanted to shoot a baboon on safari. He'd been on safari and he shot a baboon because, like all of us, he wondered what it would be like to shoot a person. Classic psychopath. Uh, so I met A.A. Gill, actually, quite recently at, a, um, at a, an award, a journalist award ceremony in London, and he came bounding up to me. It, and he, somebody had told him I'd put him in my, my book. And the first thing he said was, um, I would never sue another journalist. So I said, um, that thing that you, that you wrote about wanting to kill a baboon on safari, because like all of us, you wondered what it would be like to shoot a person. I said, it's not all of us. It's not a normal thing to think. It's just you. And he said, well, you don't hunt, so you would never understand. So I said, I sell more books than you do. <laughs> <clears throat> so by all criteria, I won. And then I thought of um, somebody else who was possibly more psychopathic than A.A. Gill. And this was a man I'd met um, 15 years ago in, in New York. Um, his name was Toto Constant. And he was a, he was a Haitian dictator. I won't go over the, his crimes, but they were terrible. And he got away with it because at the same time he was working uh, as an informant for the CIA. Um, so when he had to flee Haiti, he moved in with his mother in Queens and um, was allowed to, to remain. He said, if you don't let me stay here, then I will spill the beans about the CIA. So they let him stay. Um, the rule was that he had to stay in Queens. Queens was to be his prison. He was never allowed into Manhattan. I should say he was constantly going into Manhattan. Um, so I, th I thought at the time I was young and I was just starting out, I thought it would be um, funny to go and meet a dictator who had to move back in with his mother in Queens. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I have to say, it was not funny. There was nothing funny about it. I, I turned up in Queens, and he was, he was there wearing a pinstripe suit after a very hot day. And all he wanted to do was, was um, protest his innocence. That's, that, that was my only purpose that day, was, was to listen to him protesting his innocence. And, and it was nonsense. You know, the, the evidence against him is completely compelling. Uh, one of the items on the checklist, by the way, according to... Um, hair is compulsive lying and not caring about being caught in a lie. So a kind of shamelessness. Um, but, so all he wanted to do was protest his innocence. Um, and so I left. I was frustrated. I couldn't connect with him on any kind of empathetic level. Uh, and I never did anything with the interview. I found it kind of creepy. And at one point, he started crying. And I looked up. And I realized he was only pretending to cry. Shallow affect is one of the items on the checklist, an inability to experience a range of emotions. But now I'd done a psychopath spotting course, I was suddenly incredibly excited about my years with, with uh, about my day with Toto Constant. So I decided to write to him again, see if he would meet me again. And it turned out that he was doing um, 
12 to 37 years in jail in upstate New York for mortgage fraud. Um, so that's item 20 on the checklist. Um, um, what is item 20? Uh, uh, um, oh, I'll get back to what item 20 is. Criminal versatility. Uh, so I wrote to him and I said, I don't know if you remember me, um, but we met 15 years ago. He wrote back and said, I remember you very well. Please come and visit. Nobody ever visits me. It would just be, it would be wonderful if you came to visit me. So I'm going to read another little bit from the psychopath test as to what happened when I, when I met um, Toto Constant. <clears throat> Why didn't you come and see me last Tuesday, he asked me. That volcano erupted in Iceland and everything got put on hold, I said. OK, he said, I understand. When I got your letter, I was so excited. Really, I said. All the inmates were saying, the guy who wrote the Menisteric Goats book is coming to visit you. Wow, everyone in here has heard of that movie. Really, I said. Yes, we have a movie night every Saturday night. Last Saturday was Avatar. That movie touched me. It touched me, John. The invasion of the small nation by the big nation. I found those blue people beautiful. I found a beauty in them. Are you an emotional man, I asked. I am emotional, he nodded. By now I'm thinking I'm wasting my fucking time. I've driven like all the way from New York, and New York State turns out to be a probably no big state, and it's taken me like hours to get there. And I think he's obviously not psychopathic. Oh, shit. <laughs> Which I guess is slightly uh, callous lack of empathy, which is item six. Um, anyway, a couple of months ago, they chose the Menister at Goats movie. Most of the inmates didn't know what the hell was going on. They were saying, what's this? But I was saying, no, no, I've met the guy who wrote the book. You don't understand the guy's mind. <laughs> and then you wrote to me and said you wanted to meet me again, and everyone was so jealous. That's nice, I said. <laughs> when I heard you were coming last week, my hair was a real mess, but I wasn't scheduled to have my hair cut, so another inmate said, you take my slot. We switch slots at the barber shop, and someone else gave me a brand new green shirt to wear. Oh, God, I said. And then he just started saying to me, you know, I really want people to like me. It's very, very important that people like me. It matters a lot to me that people like me. And after a while, I said to him, isn't that a weakness, your desperate desire to have people like you? Isn't that a weakness? And he said, oh, no, it's not a weakness. And I'll tell you why. If you can get people to like you, you can manipulate them to do whatever you want them to do. <laughs> so I said, you don't really want people to like you. And he goes, oh, no, no, no. So I left Toto Constance's house that day feeling like a psychopath spotting genius. I had cracked him open with the word weakness. And I just felt incredibly proud of myself. And I was driving back to New York. And then I started to panic. And my amygdala shot signals of fear and distress and remorse up and down to my central nervous system, which my amygdala does a lot, which makes me, by the way, the neurological opposite of a psychopath. Their amygdalas underperform. And my amygdala was like overperforming. I was like very close to And I was thinking, oh my god, what if Total Constant reads my book? and decides to kill me. And then I thought, well, that's not going to happen because he's doing 12 to 37 years in jail for mortgage fraud. But what if like, one of his friends or, or relatives decides to kill me? And I, I panicked, and I kind of pulled into a drive-in Starbucks. And, uh, and I went through my notes, and I got to the part where he said, um, I, I've lost everybody who ever loved me. I, I don't have anybody left in the world. Everybody who ever loved me has betrayed me and gone. I have nobody left. And I thought, well, that's OK then. <laughs> anyway, I recounted all my findings to Robert Hare, who was unimpressed, and he said, forget about some Haitian dictator, forget about some guy at Broadmoor. The big story is corporate psychopathy. This is like the world's biggest story. And I have to say, back then, things had slightly changed. But back then, it, it was true what Robert Hare said, that this was like a hugely important story, but nobody was interested. Nobody cared when he told them that it was the solution to the greatest mysteries of all. Why the wars, why the corruption, why the tax evasion, why all these terrible things? Corporate psychopaths. This was Hare's contention that psychopathic behavior will both propel you to the top of the tree because of the kind of person it turns you into, and also the system rewards it. 
He said, this was an enormous story. Why is nobody interested? He said, you should get yourself some corporate psychopaths to interview. Uh, so I tried. I wrote to Bernie Madoff saying, can I come and interview you to find out if you're a psychopath? And he didn't write back. Uh, so then I changed tack. I wrote to Chainsaw Al Dunlap, the famous asset stripper from the 90s. Uh, I said, I believe you may have a very special brain anomaly that makes you interested in the predatory spirit and fearless. Can I come and interview you about your special brain anomaly? And he said, come on over. <laughs> so I went to our Dunlap's place. Our Dunlap's people don't know, um, would go into a failing business, fire 30% of the workforce, always with a quip. Like, for instance, he once told somebody, um, somebody once said to him, I've just bought myself a new car. And he said, you may have a new car, but I'll tell you what, you don't have a job. Uh, Plus, um, he once threatened his first wife with a knife and said he always wondered what human flesh tasted like. Plus, he didn't turn up to either of his parents' funerals. Uh, so I, I went to his house, which was filled with sculptures of predatory animals. It was like he was giving me a tour of the gardens. It was like this grand mansion. He was going over there. You've got lions and tigers and more. He was saying this in a less effeminate way. Uh, tigers and... and Falcons and eagles. It was like Narnia. Uh, and then we um, went into his kitchen, and it was Al and his wife, Judy, and his bodyguard, Sean. And I said, you know how I said in my email that you might have a special brain anomaly? And he said, yeah, it's an amazing theory. It's like Star Trek. You're going where no man has gone before. And I said, well, some psychiatrists would say that this makes you. And he went, what? And I said, a psychopath, and I've got a list in my pocket of psychopathic traits. Can I go through them with you? And he looked intrigued, because what saved me was like all of us. He loved nothing more than a mental health checklist. And um, he, said, uh, he said, OK. So I said, a grandiose sense of self-worth, which I have to say would have been a hard one for him to deny, because he was standing underneath a giant oil painting of himself. <laughs> and he said, you've got to believe in you. And I said, shallow affect. And he said, who wants to be weighed down with some nonsense emotions? And I said, manipulative. And he said, that's leadership. So he basically went through much of the checklist, redefining it as business positives. Um, but I have to say, something happened to me the day I was at our Dunlaps, which was whenever he said something to me that was non-psychopathic, I thought, well, I'm not going to put that in my book. Uh, so he said no to juvenile delinquency. He got accepted into West Point. Uh, he said no to... Um, many short-term marital relationships. He's only been married twice, and his second marriage has lasted 41 years. Um, and all of those things, I thought, well, I'm not going to put that in my book. And then I realized, of course, that becoming a psychopath spotter had turned me a little bit psychopathic in the way that I was desperate to shove Al Dunlap into a box marked psychopath, desperate to define him by his maddest edges. And I realised, yeah, you know, that's kind of what we all do as, as journalists. As my friend Adam Curtis said to me when I got back to London, he's a British documentary maker, he said, you know, we travel around the world with our notepads in our hands and we wait for the gems. And the gems are always the outermost aspects of that person's personality. And we're like medieval monks. We stitch together the gems and leave the ordinary, normal behaviour on the floor. Uh, and those gems are always the things that would be defined within the DSM as mental disorders. Um, and he said, we all know that what we do is, is odd and kind of leading to a, you know, a, a nefarious conformity. Uh, but we don't like to think about it. And what does it say about our own mental health? And I think Adam's right. I think that that is what we do as journalists. And I suppose for the last few years, I've been trying to do the opposite of that. I've been trying to not um, define people by their maddest edges. And I think it's a good point, and I'll finish here, if anybody wants to ask any questions. Um, and I just think as the, DS, as the new DSM is about to come out, and it's going to be even bigger than DSM-4, there's going to be even more mental disorders in there, um, I think it's probably a good time to think about defining people by their grey areas as opposed to their maddest edges. Thank you very much. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's got any questions. Oh, hello. I have no anybody list on the Oh, ah, yes. I like that. Thinking about the psychopathic list, I wonder if you think from an evolutionary perspective that the traits that made somebody a psychopath was give them a competitive advantage, a, a lift uh, through evolution. 
And even now, in today's mess of society, to use your words, do you think that it still gives them an advantage? Yeah, and that's certainly what Hare thinks, and and what there's a new writer on the on the block uh, called Kevin Dustin, who's just brought out a book called The Wisdom of Psychopaths, who believes that. In fact, Kevin Dustin would say that, and would go one step further, and, and it's not a step that I would take, which is that it's actually we can learn from psychopaths. It's good we can learn coolness under pressure. Um, so not only. Is it evolutionary, but it actually can be considered to be a positive, uh, which is something I don't buy because I think if you don't have empathy, if empathy just literally is absent from your brain, what would always grow in in the in the uh, barren landscape is, you know, malevolence is 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 the other items on the checklist, and, and always malevolent. And uh, an army recruiter once told me, it's, it's a very popular belief that that. Capitalism rewards psychopathic behaviour. And I think that is true to a certain extent. I think it's true in, in the kind of industries where a short-term kill uh, is beneficial, like you know, hedge funds, you could say, or fucking health insurance industry, or, um, and so on, journalism. But I think in, in, in um, businesses where actually the long term is important, it's never going to work out. There's always going to be a transgression. It's always going to be chaos. And an army recruiter said to me, you know, contrary to, to what certain people believe, we don't want psychopaths in our battalions. It's the last thing we want because they, they make terrible team players. Hi. Hi, thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. And thank you for sending the map. I feel like Ray Kerr as well. What's that? Nothing. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so, question how, um, how young do children start to exhibit some of these qualities? And are there tests that are specifically geared? for them. There's actually camps. Uh, the New York Times did this incredible piece a few months ago about summer camps for psychopathic children. Um, uh, because the, the, the fact is, one of the items on the checklist is um, early behavior problems. And the behavior tends to manifest itself from the ages Almost always, actually. This surprised me when I asked Robert Hare about this. He said this was like a big one, uh, between the ages of 8 and 10. Um, and that's obviously when you're at an age when you're not thinking about PR and you're not thinking about your career. So you will display these characteristics in, in a, in a you know, pretty open way. Um, and it's either 8 and 10 or 10 and 12. I think it might be 10 and 12, actually. I think I got that wrong. Um, Al Dunlap saying that he had no early behavior problems. And if he got accepted into West Point, that proves it. Um, shows that he's actually not, as much as we all want him to be, uh, a classic psychopath. Um, so yes, between the ages of, of it's either eight and ten or ten and twelve, I can't remember. Uh, and there was there's an incredible New York Times piece which I would, if anybody wants to read more about the possibility of psychopathic children, I, I'd recommend you read that. Thanks. Uh, hey. Uh, hey. Um, so your stories are just awesomely random, and I was wondering how you how you choose stories, and also how can you choose ones that don't go anywhere? Well, I mean. Often, um, and, it, and I find it, you know, it's you know, um, very hard. You, you, you sort of you spend months and months on Google looking for the page that nobody else has ever found uh, for, the, for the story. Um, quite often, the, the, the most depressing one that went nowhere, actually, was um, I, I was, I was going to write a book about the credit industry. I had a, I had a prophetic sense that it was all going to collapse. Um, because I wrote a piece in Lost at Sea, which is my new collection, which is available for sale just over here. Um, I wrote a piece called Who Killed Richard Cullen about a man who committed suicide because he was out of his depth with credit cards. And people kept on saying to me, you know, this is a house of cards. This isn't going to last. And I became obsessed with writing a book about the credit industry. And I, and I spent months and months on it, and I failed. And the reason why I failed, the, the terrible truth is that the the, the, the people who I met, the people who were coming up with the tricks to keep people enslaved, you know, it's terrible stuff they were doing. Um, you know, the late fee, they, they were boring people and I couldn't make them light up the page and I'd go and meet them and nothing exciting would happen. And I say, in fact, in the psychopath test, if you want to get away with wielding true malevolent power, be boring because journalists like writing about colourful, engaging people and it makes us look good. Um, so that, you know, don't be like Blofeld or monocled and ostentatious, be, be boring. Um, and then the next thing I suppose is, um, uh, okay, you've got a mystery to solve. 
and, and I like to think my books always start with a mystery, uh, and the mystery in the psychopath test. I suppose there was a few of them. It, one of them was, is it true what psychiatrists say that psychopaths rule the world? Is that true? Um, it's such a huge thing to say, and it almost sounds like a conspiracy theory, yet the people who say these things are eminent. And then, so that's the mystery that you leap into, and then you have to be completely open to wherever the story takes you. Uh, so in the book I'm, I'm writing now, the opening mystery is why do court experts get it wrong far more often than other sorts of scientists? Um, and that's the mystery that's leading me into a whole bunch of incredibly interesting areas, I think. Um, and yeah, you have to be open, not, not polemical, you know, just open to wherever the story takes you. Hi. Hi. <clears throat> Thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, so the thing I, I, I wonder, you, you gave an example uh, while talking about your book, is talking to these people and confronting them about this, this, this classification of their behavior, uh, I, th I, I think if I were to do that, I would, I would, I would panic like you did uh, coming, down, uh, mm. coming down from New York, <clears throat> from upstate New York, uh, every time. So how, <laughs> as a person with generalized anxiety disorder, how did you manage <laughs> how, um, to yeah. do that? Well, you know what I think the answer is, and this is true for people I know, you know, I've got loved ones who have OCD, and I think the thing is absolutely the same. And I think the weird truth of it is, and I'm sure this isn't true for everybody with, with any kind of anxiety disorder, but I think it's true for a lot of people, which is that the anxiety always manifests itself in completely irrational ways. And in real life frightening situations, just like everyone else, just, you know, you, you, you know, you, you analyze what risk am I actually in here um, and, you know, work it out in a kind of completely rational way. But you can't let your bloody dog off the leash in Central Park because of an irrational fear it's going to get run over. You know, so that, that's the truth of it. It's like anxiety disorders tend to manifest themselves in irrational ways that don't actually have any resemblance to reality. And when you're in genuine anxiety-inducing situations, you're fine. And don't ask me why, but that seems to be the case. <laughs> and I've also been asked to ask if Tony, if you know if Tony is still in Broadmoor. Well, OK. I, I, um, I, is the psychopath just for sale up there? Is it just lost at sea? OK, in that case, uh, does anybody mind if I sort of give away what happened to Tony? The book's still fine anyway, even if you know the ending. Um, basic, OK. Tony um, called me, and I, for, for a while I didn't take his calls because, frankly, I found the, the label terrifying. And then after a while I took his calls, and he said, you know, why haven't you been calling me? And I said, because they say that you're a psychopath. And, and he said, look, I'm not a psychopath. And he said, trying to prove you're not a psychopath is even harder than trying to prove you're not mentally ill, because one of the items on the checklist is, is um, lack of remorse. And another one is cunning manipulative. So when I say I feel terrible remorse for what I did, they say, typical of the psychopath, to cunningly um, say they feel remorse when they don't. He said it's like witchcraft. They turn everything upside down. <laughs> Uh, he said, anyway, I've, I've got a tribunal. And partly, and it, actually it was partly to do with me, I have to say, because I'd, before my book was published, I told Tony's story on This American Life, and it had a bit of an impact, and Tony sent it to various lawyers and, and um, got himself a tribunal, in part, I think, because of the publicity, because of This American Life. Um, and he got a tribunal, and in the tribunal, they let him go. Uh, he'd been in Broadmoor for... 14 years by then, 12 years in Broadmoor, two years at the Maudsley, which is a similar place. And um, they let him go uh, because they said that you shouldn't be locked up for the rest of your life because you score highly on a checklist that would imply a greater than average recidivism rate. It's almost kind of Orwellian. And out in the corridor, Tony came up to me and he said, you've got to realise, John, that Everybody's a little bit psychopathic. He said, you are, I am. Well, obviously, I am. Uh, and I said, what are you going to do now? He said, I'm going to, there's this woman in Belgium, I fancy, but she's married, and I'm going to have to get her um, split up from her husband. But you, you, know, you know what they say about a psychopath. We are manipulative. And then he disappeared off into the, into the British night. Uh, and everything was fine for about six months. 
Um, Brian, the Scientologist, would give me updates saying he was making up for lost time, uh, which I know sounded ominous, but wasn't necessarily ominous. <laughs> then he got into a bar fight uh, and ended up going to jail for a month as part of the uh, release, part of the probation. Um, he couldn't go back to the mental hospital. He had to be treated by the prison system. And by the way, the unit he was in closed down because the government actually began to think the same thoughts about, about the DSPD unit. So the unit closed down. Um, so he went to jail for a month, then he came out. Uh, and that's the last I heard until about two weeks ago when I got a tweet from somebody in a, in a bookstore who said that she that somebody in the bookstore had said to, that he was one of Tony's care workers. Um, they'd got talking about it. Uh, he was back in prison. So I looked him up. I, I, I'm one of the few people who know his, his actual name. And sure enough, he had um, racially assaulted a um, station guard uh, somewhere out, just outside London and had gone back to prison for I don't know how long, I think maybe a few months. And that's the last I've heard. So it's not a happy ending. Which, by the way, I, I, let me just say, which then begs the question, well, is it right that Tony was out? And I still, you know, so this is a very difficult question, but I still think, you know, yes, it was, for all the obvious reasons. It seems like there's sort of a, a movement towards thinking that people who have mental disorders that have, you know, psychopathy or, or things like that, you know, should be treated as criminals are, are dangerous and locked up. What do, you, what do you think about that? Well, this is the, I mean, this is the big thing, and it's a huge thing in America at the moment. You know, there's these places for paedophiles. Um, there's one in Los Angeles called Coalinga, um, where the day somebody's done their time and is released from jail, um, they immediately get sent to Coalinga, and they're locked up kind of for the rest of their lives. Because once you're in that nexus, you know, it's impossible to get out. And... There was a story in the Los Angeles Times and one of the doctors at Coalinga said a huge percentage of the people there shouldn't be there. Uh, and Robert Hare said that the people who determine who is and isn't a psychopath on behalf of Coalinga, he said he teaches them and they're just they're, they're picking their nails and they're doodling and they're going to go off and kind of have a huge effect on people's lives. So on balance, even though there is no question that psychopaths exist and there's no question that they're incredibly problematic and that they'll reoffend and reoffend and reoffend, it's still really um, hard. You know, it's still it's still a real problem to think. Well, okay, lock them up for the rest of their lives. It's, it feels that feels wrong, right? So it feels you just have to take your chances, lock them up for the amount of time that each individual crime deserved, because the alternative is worse. I, I, but, you know, I mean, what do I know? This is just, I, I, this is like three, four years of my life, and that's the conclusion I came to. But it's not an easy topic. Please can we not end on that? <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe we can end on that. I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I've been, uh, uh, I'd, I've been told I can see rooms at Google that people don't get to go to, um, so that's exciting. <laughs> Sorry. The ones with the padded walls. Right, the ones with the padded walls. When I was at TED, uh, I feel like Scooter. I was in the elevator coming up and uh, uh, talking about going to when I was at TED. Um, and but when I was at TED, uh, there was this kind of lady who runs DARPA, and she and she kind of released her killer hummingbird, and then. Um, and everyone was like kind of wowed and then thought, oh my God, this hummingbird can just kill. And now she's a bigwig at Google. <laughs> <laughs> we can't comment about one large showing hummingbirds. Um, <laughs> so there's a suggestion that 1% of people are, are psychopaths. Mm -hmm. Have they done a big enough population sampling for that to be reasonable? I, I've got to say, this is like completely subjective. I, I've, Hare is absolutely adamant that that's the percentage, 1%. And Hare is like a very, you know, respected, eminent person. I've always thought that sounds a bit high, I have to say. I the other thing is that if it skews, I don't know, white, and it skews male, and it may skew living in America, um, <laughs> I think that, 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 that those, those numbers seem, seem, seem comically high. If it's 1%, then you're up at 5% of all CEOs. It seems high, I've got to tell you. I mean, Hare is very... Cautious. He's, he, is a, he is cautious. I mean, I did have my 
slight issues with him. There was this time, and I, I, and I put this in the book, um, when I met him at a hotel in um, Heathrow, and I was looking for him everywhere. It was late at night, I couldn't find him. We'd arranged to meet, and, and I decided to go to the concierge desk to phone his room. Uh, because the queue for you know was so long at the desk, and so I went to the concierge's phone and pressed zero to get through to the operator, and the concierge can kind of storm in towards me, going, "Put down my phone!" And I said, oh, "Let's go." And he grabbed the phone and slammed it down. And then I met Robert Hare, and I said to him, "You wouldn't believe what just happened." I, the concierge just grabbed the phone off me, and it was quite frightening. And Robert Hare said, "Well, that's because he's won." <laughs> and I said, "Really?" And he's, <laughs> he said, "You should put that in your book." And I said, "I will." Um, <laughs> So, I, I mean, I agree. This is something I don't say very often because I, I, I have a lot of respect for Robert Hare, and I really do, and I think his checklist is, is onto something, but I've always thought 1% seems high. Yeah. Okay, well, look, well, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, and happy Christmas. <laughs>